1728, a Virginian named William Byrd wrote his History of the Dividing Line, which was a critical commentary on North Carolina society. Again, I wish Tybee was here because she's from that good state. Speaking of the town of Edenton, which was on the ocean and fairly close to Virginia, he wrote this. This is the only metropolis in the Christian or Mohammedan world where there is neither church, chapel, mosque, synagogue, or any other place of public worship of any sect or religion whatsoever. What little devotion there may be is much more private than their, their vices. Let me read that last line. What little devotion there may happen to be is much more private than their vices. The people seem easy without a minister as long as they are exempted from paying him. Sometimes the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, that was a Church of England uh, missionary outreach, sometimes they had the charity to send over missionaries to this country, but unfortunately the priest has been too lewd for the people, or, which oftener happens, they are too lewd for the priest. For these re reasons, these reverend gentlemen have always left their flocks as errant heathen as they found them. Remember, this is 1728 America. The established church, here as elsewhere in the colonies, also suffers a dearth of worthy candidates for the pulpit. In some instances, clergymen disgraced their callings and brought scandal to the church by keeping concubines or appearing drunk in public. Now, there's nothing, few things more damaging to the reputation of Christ and to his church than an unrighteous preacher of righteousness. The Apostle Paul knew this all too well. And still, he had the long view, and he's playing the longest game ever, and that is the establishment of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the passage we're reading this morning, which will finish the chapter next week, in verses 16 and 17, Paul here is directing Timothy to that one rule of faith, the Bible, but he's using real life examples to compare and contrast righteousness and wickedness. This is part 10 of our series, Advancing Under Fire. Read along as I, uh, as I read from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and perseverance, persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. So at a time when the church suffered from intense persecution and continuing confusion regarding what to believe and how to live, Paul writes this second of his two letters to his young protege, Timothy. And I've got this uh, cataloged under three headings this morning that we'll pay attention and watch for. First of all, doctrine, then life, then sufferings. And first of all, in verses 10 and 11, Paul contrasts Timothy and Paul's own lives with those that we considered last week, those uh, evil men, uh, imposters whose uh, whose folly will be known to all. They're not going to get far. But it's always in contrast with these false teachers that have snuck into the fellowship and draw away disciples after themselves, offering something other than the gospel by which uh, people either are, are still left in their sin or they're allowed to sin with impunity. It always leads to more ungodliness, no, though whatever this uh, teaching was that it snuck into the Ephesian church. These false and hypocritical teachers, they oppose the truth. They're men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. 
And he again reminds Timothy of his own life and his own struggles and his own deliverance from these struggles by the Lord. And just as a side, isn't it encouraging that Paul is not one of these lorded over you type of leaders, but he's willing and able to set an example by what he said and did. We read that all, all through the scriptures. I've tried to set an example and work hard with my hands and not taking anyone's food. And so Paul was, Paul was one of these guys that was just down in the trenches and uh, not in some ivory tower somewhere directing the affairs of his, uh, his young uh, assistants. And here's where he connects it all together. Paul was a man of integrity. And he knew Timothy to also be a man of integrity. I love that word. It means, in one sense, it means to be in a state of wholeness, to be undivided. Our hearts must be undivided in our worship of Christ and our service to him. And, and our confession must, must all, always match our conduct. Now he begins by making this statement of fact. And there's a sense in the, in the Greek here, it's, there's a however there, which I believe the ESV and the NIV you, however, have followed my teaching. He's contrasting what we just heard about these wicked men and that long, long list of wicked vices that I read last week. You, however, Timothy, in contrast to these, you followed my teaching and my conduct and my purpose and faith and patience, love, perseverance, persecution and suffering. So again, that makes the more obvious connection between Timothy and the scoundrels of last week. This is, this is where we'll say it's the area of doctrine, where Timothy is following Paul's doctrine. You see, Timothy was an assistant to Paul. He was mentored by Paul, trained by him, taught by him, and discipled by him. And one of the most important ways that we train people isn't necessarily in the classroom, but it's by example. One of the best ways I trained my son to be a man is by being a man with him around me. Whether that's when we're working together or just living together. And of course, just like the, the, the wise father in Proverbs, you'll take him aside. Now my son observed this and my son listened to your mom and all of that. But if it's not uh, equally matched by a healthy example, then that teaching is just kind of empty. It really doesn't carry the weight that it should. Paul tried to set an example for all believers, and he encouraged Timothy to set an example as well. Just a couple of examples of Paul setting an example. In 2 Timothy 3, 7, or 2 Thessalonians 3, 7, this is in reference to sloth, and you would think that, okay, this is, you know, Paul's writing a letter to the church. It's going to be all about Christian stuff, right? All about doctrine and gospel and well, this is very practical, isn't it? He says, you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. A little later on, he says, if a man does not work, he shall not. You would think we would see people not working would be a bunch of skinny folks because they can't eat. Well, it doesn't work that way in our country. So there's an example there. We're not idle. We didn't eat anyone's food without paying for it. In other words, they didn't take advantage of his position as an apostle, as a church leader, which oftentimes that would take place, even in the, even in the, the, uh, the time period right after the, uh, the canonization, the, the writing of the scriptures. There's a, there's a document called the Didache, and in that there's a very uh, strong exhortation to the churches not to allow one of these traveling prophets to stay too long because they were taking advantage of their status as a traveling itinerant preacher. To the Philippians, he wrote, join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. And another one, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So there we see Paul's teaching intertwined directly with his life or pattern of living. And he's saying, you, however, Timothy, this is true of you now. It's not like he's 
saying, you need to start following my example, but he's encouraging Timothy. Remember, it's, there's a lot of hard times coming for our, our young pastor here. You, however, however, have followed my teaching. It's like he's saying to Timothy, this is your track record so far. I, Paul, have set you ex an example, and now you are replicating it in your own life. Timothy had been Paul's assistant in ministry, and these two tracks of both faith and practice, doctrine and life, teaching and life, are vital to every Christian if they're going to be faithful followers of Jesus. So let's walk through this, this list that we find in verse 10 and make uh, some comments on it and we'll work through the passage that way. First of all, teaching. Timothy, you followed my teaching. What, what teaching would that be? Is Paul referring to just his own teaching there when he says mine? Well, no, he's, he's speaking in terms, of course, of receiving it from Christ. And all of the apostolic teaching is, is unified. There's not one apostle teaching one thing and Peter's over here teaching another and Paul and, and Barnabas teach. No, it's all one message, all one gospel. And it's often referred to as the pattern of sound words, that apostolic message of justification by grace alone through faith alone, holding to the truth of the gospel with no adulterations or admixtures of heresy. Again, that's doctrine, and we should never downplay or diminish the importance of doctrine. Um, that's kind of a popular trope these days, they'll say, well, doctrine divides, love unites. Well, when it comes to good and bad, righteousness and wickedness, I want those things divided. I don't want them trying to coexist or have a peace treat or a truce between them, especially in our own lives, but then, of course, in the church. Doctrine should divide. It should divide the wheat from the chaff, the sheep from the goats, the good from the bad, it's, what, it's one of the purposes of sound teaching is to make sure that you're not uh, inculcating worldly ideas, worldly thinkings. Remember, don't be conformed or pressed into the mold of the world. The next one, conduct. Again, this is the example that Paul sets, how he lived his life. So how Paul would comport himself in all kinds of situations. You know, we joke about, you know, Paul as a ministerial candidate with his list of riots and stonings and having to escape from towns in a basket and things of this nature. But Paul's main concern was to please the Lord, but Paul wasn't offensive. He, he gladly bore the offense of the cross, but Paul himself wasn't an offensive guy. And in fact, in his defenses before Roman governors, he would say, I... I'm only doing what, what the Old Testament scriptures were prophesying about. I'm only proclaiming Jesus in the resurrection. I'm not doing anything weird here. And of course, in every city he went, the Jews would stir up trouble for him and he'd be hounded out or stoned and left for dead, things of this nature. He goes on, his purpose. What is Paul's purpose? Well, I would think in terms of maybe Romans 1, 14, and 15, I am under obligation, both to the Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. He's obligated to preach the gospel. I'm so eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome, in Romans' case. Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. But when he had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Paul's purpose, his, his life, was subsumed in the proclamation of the gospel, especially to the Gentiles. That was Paul's calling. It was his, his mission, his purpose. Is I, I'm going to do whatever it takes to proclaim the gospel. Paul, do you think you convinced me so quickly? Not only you, but everyone here would be like me except for these chains. On and on and on, Paul would tell people, this, this is what I'm about. I'm going to proclaim the gospel. I, I love how in Acts 17, which Heidi read a little from earlier, the only reason Paul got the platform that he did was because beforehand, in what we might call just 
conversations that were taking place, he was talking about the resurrection of the dead, which is part and parcel of, of course, the gospel. So he got his opportunity by saying something that everybody thought was just insane and weird. But his purpose then as a springboard for preaching the gospel of faith and repentance didn't come from him being weird. It came from him telling the truth. And that's going to tie into those who want to live godly in Christ Jesus. Those who tell the truth about the way things really are. Yeah, you're going to suffer persecution. But getting ahead of myself. Faith. It's the fourth of the things that Timothy has followed. Paul's faith. Faith in God. Faith that trusts completely in the God who called him by his grace. This is the kind of faith that is true saving faith. Not the faith of James where you uh, say one thing and do another. It's not the kind of faith that is temporary, here today, gone tomorrow. It's the kind of faith that perseveres. It's the faith that recognizes our utter and abject need for a sinless advocate before our holy God. It's the fifth one, patience. Have you ever asked God for patience? Have you ever been that naive as to ask God for patience? God answers your prayer. How does he do that? By putting you in a frustrating situation where your patience is tested. Well, <laughs> patience is hard to teach and it's hard to learn, but sometimes you can emulate patience. Have you ever observed someone who's older in the faith than you and wiser and you watch them interact with the fool? And you're thinking, how, how is he not just flying off and saying the most okay, Captain Obvious? I tend to be a little more sarcastic. I, I confess that. But uh, when you've observed a wiser man interact with some, someone, it carries so much value. And so Timothy would have easily been able to observe Paul and all of these situations. Remember all of the different dialogues and interactions um, in Ephesus, for almost three years, Paul had set up his teaching camp, as it were, in, in the hall of Tyrannus. And so there would be daily, when he, when he wasn't making tents, when he wasn't cutting straight on the fabric of whatever it was they made tents out of back then, he was teaching in this hall. And that teaching would have involved interaction with the crowd. Can you imagine some of the questions that came up in this city known for being the center of Diana worship. I, I can't imagine. It's amazing. We still get it today, though. How can you believe in a Bible that says that the earth is only so old and God created everything? When we know that the earth is billions of years old, and I saw a film on tree rings, it disproves the whole Bible. So, no, you got to be patient. As we heard a few weeks ago, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but patient, kind to everyone, gently instructing those who oppose. Love, the supreme virtue and motivation for the Christian. Love that is self-giving and humble, not self-seeking or self-centered, but others-centered, which is how love for God is manifest in our love for our brothers. And finally, perseverance. Paul says, Timothy, you followed me in perseverance. There were others, and you read through the uh, Paul's missionary journeys. There were some who didn't quite stick around like they should have, but Timothy has. Don't give up. Perse perseverance through persecutions and sufferings. And listen, if anybody had an excuse, a rational reason for throwing in the towel, it was Paul. Let me just read from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, where Paul is taking a little kind of a, a little a little bit of let me just demonstrate to those who were questioning his apostleship what his street cred was what what the recognized uh, viability of Paul's apostolic ministry and he says this far greater labors far more imprisonments with countless beatings often near death Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one, the 39 stripes. We, that's almost common parlance today because they, they thought that, well, 40 would kill you, so let's just stop at 39. It goes, once I was 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys. In dangers from rivers. Dangers from robbers. Danger from my own people. Danger from the Gentiles. Danger in the city. Danger in the wilderness. Danger at sea. Danger from false brothers. Toil. Hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from all these things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. This is the, this is the Apostle Paul. So Timothy and all y'all this morning, don't give up. Have perseverance. If Paul could go through all of that and still say, I have much more work to do than I think we can too. Now what's interesting is that he, he mentions in our text this morning, such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and what persecutions I endured. What had happened to Paul at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra? And why did he only mention these three? In the list I just read from 2 Corinthians, there were a lot more than just these three. Well, first of all, these three locations are all located in Timothy's home province of Galatia. And Lystra was his hometown, is where Timothy grew up. So Timothy would have had first-hand knowledge of what Paul was talking about. So in Pisidian Antioch, Paul was stoned and left for dead. At Iconium, they tried to kill him by stoning. And both of these events took place before Paul met Timothy. So it's almost like, Timothy, you know this stuff. You were, you were in the same area. No doubt you heard about this Paul guy who they are trying to kick out of the region. And Lystra, of course, represents the whole general area where Timothy lived. And verse 11b says, What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. We know the Lord rescued Paul because he's writing the letter. <laughs> he's still alive to write, right? Seriously, though, we're not, we're not told that God won't allow us to suffer in this way, nor are we guaranteed that we're going to pass through unscathed. But the Lord rescued Paul, and the ultimate rescue for all of us is possessing Christ and all of his benefits. I mean, we're not guaranteed our next breath. We're not guaranteed that God won't move, remove his hand. I, I think we see it a little bit in America. We see his hand of restraint being pulled back as his judgment falls. And you see crazy, more craziness than I think we remember seeing. But Paul says, and the Lord rescued me. from Even though he was at the point of physical death, yet the Lord rescued him. So Paul is saying, Timothy... He rescued me, he'll rescue you. You've got these things in your future without a shadow of a doubt. Follow my lead. This is how Paul is passing the torch on to Timothy. Remember earlier in the book, we would join with me in suffering for the gospel. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. But Paul goes on, he says, it's not just, not just you, Timothy. I think that's why I believe this... This letter is intended to be read to the church at Ephesus. Paul says, it's not just me. In fact, anyone who wants to live righteous, live godly in Christ Jesus, if you're serious, you're going to get hammered in some way. In verse 12, indeed, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Okay, first of all, does that mean all are going to suffer the same persecution? Well, no. And does it mean that all Christians are going to be persecuted without any shadow of a doubt? Well, not necessarily. There are many levels and degrees of persecutions. And of course, not all true godly Christians are going to suffer martyrdom like Paul did. Calvin says it's not only in one way that Satan persecutes the servants of Christ. But yet it is absolutely unavoidable, 
unavoidable that all Christians will have the world for their enemy in some form or another. That their faith may be tried and their steadfastness proved for Satan, who is the continual enemy of Christ, will never suffer anyone to be at peace in his whole life. I've had some interactions with American Christians who they criticize their, uh, their fellow American Christians for, quote, making an idol out of safety. Well, I guarantee that that guy isn't in danger when he's making that, when he's writing that on his little keyboard in his parents' basement. The point is that they're trying to say that any persecution that's not full on line up gun to the back of the head really isn't worthy of the name persecution. But that's not true. Or else Paul would have made that clear that only the kind that ends in your life being taken is true persecution. I've said it before, persecution doesn't usually start with the knock at the door at midnight. You know, we always talk about that with the, the KGB or whatever, but it doesn't start there. It can start with reducing the scope of your business because you refuse to do something that somebody thought you should do. You can fill in the blanks, you know what I'm talking about. Access to resources. Circumscribing the area where Christians can exercise their free speech as citizens. Oh, well, that's not real persecution. Really. Free speech zones. You can only say certain things within 500 feet of the abortion clinic. Is that persecution? Well, yeah, in one sense it is. Because with any other topic in any other location, you could be saying that stuff. But they're saying, no, we don't want to hear the truth. That's too ugly. And that just disturbs our clients. Oh, I, I, could, I could go on here for a while, I won't. So you gotta have 500 foot buffer zone between the abortion clinic and you and your signs, or we'll send you to jail. And so these aforementioned American Christians would say, that's not really persecution. That's making light of those people who are maybe locked up in Iraq or Iran or whatever. I'm like, no, no. The only option is that Christians can, can gather in these little you know, spaces on Sunday morning, and this is it, guys, this is, this is it. This is the exercise of our religion. <coughs> this is the free exercise. We're letting you do this. Oh, thank you so very much. F.B. Meyer says this, the world does not love Christ or Christians any better than of old, and all who are minded to live godly lives will come inevitably to the cross in one form or another. To be without some degree of persecution should put us in serious doubt as to whether we're really living godly. The spirit of the gospel is, is in absolute disagreement with the spirit of the world. So here we are, 2018, on the corner of Sierra Web Road and 1000 North, surrounded by corn, and we're really not suffering the kind of persecution that the vast majority of Christians for the last 2,000 years have. I mean, we live in a, the land of the free, home of the brave, mom, apple pie, Chevrolet. This is, this is pretty nice, right? Um, I just read my Voice of the Martyrs magazine, and these poor brothers and sisters of ours just, they can't meet in the building because the building got burned down because they're trying to live godly in Christ Jesus in Nigeria or the Sudan. So what do they do? They go out in the jungle, and they literally have their deacons um, armed with AKs so that they don't all just get slaughtered while they're having their worship service. And we find it hard to show up for church. <laughs> huh? They still show up for church, right? <clears throat> Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Our, our country was founded upon assumptions that whether they were consistently followed, we know they weren't, that were found in the Bible. 
there was this recognition of the image of God in every person. There's a recognition that basic fundamental uh, laws that are, that are found on the Ten Commandments, found in the Gospel of Christ, well, we're no longer there. Now we're in a situation where up is down, black is white, bad is good, and we're just grown-up animals, you know. So we're going to have to be thinking in terms of consistent Christian worldview. And just as our example from early American history, the people of Eden in North Carolina, they seem to get along fine in their little town as long as the minister is just as sinful as everyone else. It's when they themselves lived godly in Christ Jesus that the fireworks began. I don't know if you're familiar with the first great awakening, but uh, men like John Wesley would be pelted with refuse when they preached repentance in those little villages of England, taking the gospel out. And he had a similar response to Paul did. John Calvin again says this, as soon as zeal for God is manifested by a believer, it kindles the rage of all ungodly men. And although they have not a drawn sword, yet they vomit out their venom, either by murmuring or by slander, or by raising a disturbance or by other methods. In other words, it, it doesn't always look like A or B. As I said a couple weeks ago, if you're serious about living out God's truth, then be aware the enemy is going to get to know your address pretty well. There are always going to be wicked men that are thorns in our sides. Verse 13, evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So it's not only bad enough that they deceive others, but they're self-deceived as well. That's almost can you imagine? It's almost unthinkable. I mean, if you're self-deceived, how do you know that you're deceived? <laughs> you're stuck. It's kind of like you're stuck unless there's something from the outside comes and clears things up. And how do you know anything for sure in that position? Matthew Henry wrote this, those who deceive others do but deceive themselves. You can't help it. Tell so you ever ever heard anyone who's just kind of prattling on and on and and they get asked the question, do you believe everything that you're telling us right now? Do you really? Do you know when you're lying? Some people get in such a habit of not telling the truth that it becomes second nature. They can't even they actually convince themselves of their own lies. What a horrible situation. They're not deceiving God, though, and ultimately they're not going to deceive those who, because of constant use or practice, have trained their senses to discern good and evil. That's Hebrews 5.14. There is a strain of thinking that revels in uncertainty and skepticism. It's postmodernism, but I don't think that's what's being talked about here. So these wicked teachers going around deceiving people, bad to worse, and the Apostle Paul then begins to point, Timothy, which we're going to conclude next week, towards that which will ensure that Timothy and you and I as well, we aren't waylaid and sidelined or shipwrecked. Verse 14, you, however, continue in the thing. So isn't that interesting? He begins by saying, you, Timothy, have followed my example. Now, verse 14, you, Timothy, continue in the things that you've learned and become convinced of knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So the ultimate solution Paul gives for Timothy against these deceiving, deceived false teachers to encourage him to continue on in Paul's uh, teaching and conduct and practice and perseverance it's not to be found in church councils or traditions or in ritual or any external consideration. No, it is found in the word of God, the scriptures. This is written to remind him of the clarity and the authority and sufficiency of the word of God. 
And especially in this section, we're reminded of the centrality of the written word. He says, Timothy, you followed my example, continue to do so, and remember the character of those people from whom you learned the scripture. We know that Timothy had a godly heritage and mentioned his grandmother Lois, his mother Eunice, and he ties this heritage together back with the source that they're giving him, and that's the Holy Bible to make you wise into salvation. And we'll flesh that out much more next week. So the question I have for you is this, in light of everything we've read this morning and, and discussed, are, are you desiring to live godly in Christ Jesus? You know, it's one, it's one thing to recognize your, your sinfulness and your sin and to turn from that and, and trust in Christ, but there's so much more to the Christian life that's the beginning. That's, that's where it all starts. You were asking earlier about what does it mean to be born again. Well, that's, it begins. God gives you a new heart and you turn to Christ and you re leave your life of sin and autonomy and self-rule and trusting only in Jesus. And then the devil gets your address and you ask God for patience and things start blowing up. And Paul says he promises all those who desire to live godly, Remember from 1 Timothy, all of the emphasis on godliness and how that is the, the remedy. You know, the devil is called the accuser because he brings a charge against God's people. And it's much easier for the enemy to get his foot in your door if you are not really striving to live godly in Christ Jesus. If you've got sins that you Maybe you're not struggling as hard as you should be against those sins. Everybody will say, well, I'm really struggling with this. Well, have you, have you put a filter on your computer? Are you, are you doing what's necessary? Well, I'm thinking about it. That's not struggling. That's, that's kind of playing around, playing around in the playground of the world and of the, of the enemy and of the flesh. If you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, I've got just a a couple of takeaways and we'll, we'll conclude with this. Uh, number one, be a part of a fellowship of Christians that loves you and who preaches the truth of the word of God, who aren't afraid to enter into dialogue and discussion and try to help you out. We need each other, we can't do this alone. Uh, God has put us in a body in which not everybody's a foot, not everybody's a brain, heart, but we all have things that we have to bring to the table and bring to the equation so that God's people are encouraged that we can live godly in Christ Jesus. The other thing is, too, that, you know, shiny things. The world is alluring and it's flashy and it's got a lot of makeup on, <laughs> if I can say that. It's covered in troweled on falsity. Never forget, listen, the, the prize is Christ. The real issue, the real issue is, is your standing with God. Of course, it's based entirely on the righteousness of Jesus. But he didn't save us just so we could be translated immediately into glory. He saved us so that we would be conformed in his image, so that we would live godly and carry on this task of building the church, of, of seeing people, men and women and boys and girls, come to faith in Christ released from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of light, his son, who he loves. So live godly in Christ Jesus. Be prepared for resistance. It's life. That's what we've been promised. You get everything. You get Jesus. You get forgiveness. You get positive righteousness that's not your own. And you also get persecutions. So you might as well just hunker down and be ready for it. All right? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the promises that you give us in your word, that you'll never leave us or forsake us, that we can always rely on you. And we also thank you for the promises of your word that, that those who really desire to live uprightly and godly in Christ Jesus will, will be resisted by the world. Now, Lord, help us not to always be on the back foot with this, but to understand and realize that uh, 
sin is a disgrace and you have provided us with the only means by which we can lose that disgrace and lose the shame of our own sin. And that's through faith and trust in Christ and repentance from sin. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who is unsure of whether they really desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, I pray that you will, uh, you will convict their heart, that you will have your way in all of our lives this morning. Help us to, to really desire more and more to be conformed to the image of Christ and to live godly in Christ Jesus. We ask it all for your glory. Amen.